This is the lecture for European history for Friday, the 11th of February, 2022. The ideas of Charles Darwin seem old hack to us. The notion that life is like clay on a potter's wheel, sculpted by circumstance in order to shape forms more adapted to different moments in evolutionary history. However, when it was first promulgated after voyages to places like the Galapagos Islands, where Darwin develops his theory, it not only runs counter to the details of Seventh Day or Seven Day Genesis creation, but even though references to God are made in the Origin of Species, Darwin's book, the spirit of Genesis also seems to be violated. Instead of a God acting to purposely create different creatures for different roles, placing mankind and dominion over them, allowing Adam to name them, instead of all that, blind forces of environment kill certain species before they can breed in sufficient numbers so they die off and reward others. They reward certain traits within the species and punish others. It is a process that, as Darwin says, has been operating since its creator first breathed life into the earliest forms, as this planet has gone spinning around its sun. In other words, God sets up the clockwork me mechanism of evolution, and evolution works on its own. Darwin's idea shocks and offends people of faith who think that he's trying to take God out of the equation. It offends casual observers who draw cartoons of Darwin's ancestor, which is an orangutan or a monkey. <laughs> and people famously say, well, Mr. Darwin, your ancestors may be primates, but mine are Adam and Eve. So there's controversy. But as time goes on, Darwin's ideas become more generally acceptable in the public to end up with uh, poor folks like me who do not see a conflict necessarily between an evolutionary method of creation and a divine source of creation. I'm not trying to compromise. I just, I see a huge universe and I see God working through natural laws as well as miracles. I don't think that God needs to demonstrate his existence through miracles as much as I see God revealed in the complex life that's around us, in the way life and the universe and everything operates. I don't see that as random. I don't see it as happenstance. But all of this discussion about where life comes from or how life develops makes for an interesting conversation, if done properly. But what if you take Darwin's ideas and apply them to us? Not us as Homo sapiens sapiens thinking thinking man. No. As us as different nations, as different races, as different ethnic groups. What if we apply Darwinian principles of survival of the fittest? to national communities. A nation is unified by blood, by soil, by tradition. A nation is distinct from all others. And what I'm speaking about here is a nation as in a tribe, as in a group of people, an ethnic group, even a race. That's the term I'm speaking. I'm not speaking in terms of a nation state. I'm speaking here of a group of people. 
We speak the same language. We have the same holidays. We have the same faith. We have the same notions of good manners and bad manners. We have the same food. We are a distinct people, set apart from all others. We are a nation. Rich or poor, urban or rural, we are one people. And the idea of nation grows in importance after the French Revolution. The French visit nationalism on the rest of Europe when almost all Frenchmen end up coming into direct support of the armies of the French Republic and then Napoleon. And the French nation awakens German nationalism by having Frenchmen struck through all the cities of Germany as conquerors. It awakens Russian nationalism. It reawakens Polish nationalism, Lithuanian nationalism. It awakens Hungarian nationalism, Romanian nationalism, Italian nationalism, Spanish and Portuguese nationalisms, because nationalism is a potent force. So why not view Darwin's principles as useful in understanding how nations interact? If you take Hobbes's idea of these giant amoebic leviathans, these nation-state communal organisms, as existing, writhing, and wrestling with one another across the face of the map of Europe, then it's easy to see the different nationalisms as different species in a Darwinian struggle to survive. Flemish Belgians and Walloon Belgians lose sympathy for one another because they are different nations within the same country. Poles are frustrated, rightly so, because their nation has been erased by the Austrians, Prussians, and Russians. So too with Latvians, Estonians, Lithuanians, Livonians, white Russians, Ukrainians, Bessarabians, today called Moldovans, and all the other various peoples of Europe. If Darwin's ideas apply to society, social Darwinism, is a insight. What does this insight reveal about us and the way people should interact in international relations? Well, the idea of Christendom is gone. Gone. The notion that we are one civilization, Christendom, a Christian civilization, unified by faith, different countries, different kings, a Holy Roman Empire, a bunch of grand duchies, but we're all Christians. And even after the Protestant Reformation, there is still a broad sense of Judeo-Christian civilization, as distinct from what the Hindus or the Muslims or the Buddhists or anyone else produces around the world. Judeo-Christian Western civilization is still set apart. It is still unique, and, and rightly so. But now, if we're going to view the Basques as a different nation from the Catalans, as a different nation from the Spaniards, as a different nation from the French, we're not dealing with a group of Christian societies that share certain cultural and religious and philosophical presumptions. No, what we're dealing with is an absolute knockdown, drag out, merciless struggle for survival, eat or be eaten, kill or be killed. And if you want to understand just why the 20th century is such a bloody butcher house, this is why. You combine the notion of tribalism that is at the heart of nationalism. We are one people set apart. And all other people are different from us. And all other people, by implication, are lesser than us. And we can't come together in long-term peace, because long-term peace is a lie. It's an illusion. Evolution does not reward long-term peace and cooperation. Evolution rewards victory, and nothing but victory. So, the first great genocide of the... 20th century was perpetrated by the Turkish government against the Armenian people, a Christian community in the Caucasus. As Turks invaded Russia during the First World War, 
they crossed Armenia. And they were afraid that the Armenians would betray Ottoman Turkey. So they butchered them wholesale. Men, women, children. Entire towns, entire cities wiped out. And today the Turkish government and people still cowardly refuse to acknowledge their part as the first perpetrators of genocide in the 20th century. But that's only the first. This idea of social Darwinism steals any sense of empathy. If somebody is an outsider, Ino Gorodi, from another town, if somebody is an Auslander, a foreigner, they're a different species. They're not a fellow child of God. They're not a fellow human being. They're an enemy. It's their children who will inherit the earth, or it's your children. What social Darwinism gives European Christian Western civilization is the gift of savage barbarism, of a Manichaean look at the struggles of nations, Mani being the great prophet of Zoroastrianism, who said that everything in this world is black or white, there is no gray. And in this struggle between darkness and light, there can be no peace. There can be no compromise. It's Sauron or the free peoples. Nothing in between. So, ironically, at the point where European Christian Western civilization is becoming the first industrialized society on the planet, those Christian morals and ethics that have restrained savagery in Europe, not eliminated it, but restrained it, kept it in line. Well, there's no longer a single church to oppose the governments when the governments go feral. And now, with Darwinism and the idea that religion is passe and that modern people need to be scientific, you have the misapplication of a principle of biological development applied to human interactions that steal compassion, steal mercy, steal restraint, steal any sense of being a fellow human being, and return us to the point where we're fighting over the water hole, and one of us gets a stick, like in that scene from 2001, A Space Odyssey where our interactions with outsiders is to club them over the head, maybe eat them. Social Darwinism is part and parcel of communism, of national socialism, of fascism, of all of the various other isms of the 20th century and down to the current day. Islamo-fascism has social Darwinistic ideas. Chinese communism, which is fascism by any other name, national socialism, is deeply racist. They are committing genocide while the hypocritical athletes of the world and their business sponsors are competing in Beijing's Olympics. You thought looking, well, you'll learn about the 1936 Olympics in Germany under Hitler. There are people who look back on that with shame. That's nothing compared to this. Because the world didn't really know that Hitler was preparing a genocide against Jews, gypsies, homosexuals, devout Christians, and anyone else that didn't fit into his new order. <laughs> but we know that for decades, the Chinese Communist Party has harvested the, or harvested the organs of its victims. Has taken the Tibetan people out of their country. Is taking the Uyghur people out of their country. Anyone who is not racially Han Chinese is a target. And yet the world is there. I don't understand it. But then again, I have never really been tempted to make that much money. The nation, the idea of the nation, of the people, of the unique thing that we all share in common, being, being fellow members of the nation, 
can be a wonderful thing. But when combined with social Darwinism, when combined with the notion that different nas nations are different species in a eater be eaten survival of the fittest struggle, it has produced undescribable horror. Now let's talk about one of the happy stories of nationalism. Risorgimento. It happens in the boot, Italia. So uh, here is a map of pre-unification Italia, Italy. Fairly simple. Between the Adriatic Sea, the Ligurian Sea, the Tyrrhenian Sea, the Ionian Sea, broadly the Mediterranean Sea, you've got the island of Sicily, which is just peeking in here. You've got the islands of Sardinia and Corsica, which are smaller than they should be. You've got the peninsula of Italy, which is badly shaped. It's much too big a toe. And we've got the area of the pelvis of Italy, south of the Arc of the Alps. Italy is not unified. In the south, you have the kingdom of the two Sicilies, with Naples as its capital. This used to be part of Cat uh, Catalonian and then Spanish territory. But now, southern Italy is the island of Sicily, and uh, Italy south of the Papal States um, is the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Then you've got the knee of the Italian leg, Rome and the Papal States, which stretch from Ostia and Rome on the west coast up to Ravenna on the east coast. And this area has been in the hands of the Pope for well over a thousand years. You've got Florence's territory of Tuscany, Etruscans, Etruria, Tuscany. Um, you've got Venetia, the greater territory of the city-state of Venice. You've got Milan and Lombardy. You've got one of the more interesting, Piedmont Sardinia. Piedmont Sardinia includes the foothills of the Alps as they come down to kiss the Mediterranean Sea at Nice, and also the island of Sardinia. Corsica, of course, is French. And there are some lesser states like Modena here in north-central Italy. So Italy is divided. Now, the Italian language is spoken, but there are a bunch of Germans here in the north. Uh, the Tyrol and Istria certainly are coveted by Italian nationalists. The Austrians control that. At the beginning of this, the Austrians also control Lombardy and Venetia. I think what I'm going to do is put in a little dotted line to show you the Austrian territory at the beginning of this process. So, how do we get from this in the middle 1800s to a unified Italian nation state? Well, we're going to take a journey. I need to turn on the projector. Would you over there please um, turn off the right light switch and close the shades? Haley. Uh, Darwin, at the very least, indicated deistic tendencies. I don't know. I also well, here's what I think. I think Darwin starts out without a con without a faith conflict, particularly. I don't know if he was ever strongly a man of faith, but I think that as time goes on and as criticism flies his way, Darwin takes against religion. So I think Darwin in his young adult years is very different in his beliefs from Darwin in his old age. If anyone knows more than that about uh, good old Charles Darwin, be my guest to raise your hand and offer your opinion. I know that he changed. I, I'm not a specialist, though I don't know every detail. Okay, so we're going to start our story of Italian unification with a Frenchman, of course. Actually, with a Corsican. Behold, the Emperor Napoleon III, nephew of Napoleon Bonaparte. Napoleon III wangles his way to the leadership of a new French empire early and mid-century. Napoleon III is famous for his waxed mustaches that go out. Salvador Dali mimics this in the 20th century of his poofy uh, little uh, 
goatee or Van Dyke. Napoleon III is the emperor of the French, and he's a popular emperor. He's not like a king who's distant. He's the kind of emperor that Julius Caesar wanted to be, that Augustus was. An emperor for the people, baby. An emperor that will bring social reform and that will help poor people. An emperor that will make people proud, proud to be French again. Proud to be French again. Um, that's the kind of guy Napoleon III is. But to do this, he's got to get Le Gois. Le Gois is the glory. G-L-O-I-R-E. Le Gois. The glory. No doubt Dr. LeBlanc would say it with more finesse. Le Gois. And to get the glory, he's got to do some glorious things, just like Uncle uh, Napoleon Bonaparte did. So Napoleon III is a, an emperor looking for a mission, looking for something noble to do in the international realm. We'll come back to him. Behold, Joe Matz, Joey Matz, Giuseppe Mazzini. His name is Giuseppe Mazzini. And Giuseppe Mazzini is a thinker, a philosopher, and a politician who early in, in the early and mid-1800s inspires a focused idea of Italian nationhood. Mazzini is the great dreamer, and his ideas... Uh, and actions form the foundation of efforts to bring all of the Italian states under one rule. So, Giuseppe Massini, uh, and Giuseppe means Joe, Joseph. So, Massini is inspiring a lot of Italians, and Napoleon is looking for work, glorious work to do. And now we come to him. This is Count Camillo Benzo de Cavour. Count Cavour, or the Conte de Cavour, is the, becomes the Prime Minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. He works for a king named Vittorio Emmanuel, Victor Emmanuel II. And Cavour is in a position to try to implement some of Mazzini's ideas by appealing to Napoleon III. We'll come back to him. And I will assume that you'll be able to see the map. So, I don't want to shut it off because I'll have to turn it on again. So just try to see here the map. Maybe there's another thing I can do. Maybe I can project a black screen. Let's see. Black screen. Oh, there are videos. But there are also images. I'm going to try this image here. Link. Oh, well, that'll do. That's better than nothing. So, here's France. And Count Cavour is the Prime Minister of Piedmont, Sardinia. Would it, would it be better just to have a white screen? Let's see. It's all his problem by pressing a button. No, I'm not going to just press a button. You technophile, I'm not going to do that. Technology, it's your friends. Well, I was going to write on it. No. No. Shaughnessy suggests pulling the relationship. Yeah, but this is more fun. This is hard. Fine, that'll do. There. No, it's not wide enough. Zoom in on the white screen. Oh, I can do that. Yeah. Ha ha! Oh, look at that. Oh, that's brilliant. I hate technology and it hates me. So, France, Piedmont, Sardinia, Austria. Austria includes, actually, Austria probably includes Modena and the other two. 
But Austria includes northeastern Italy. And so, Cavour makes a secret deal with Nappy Baby, the third. Napoleon. And what he what the proposal is, is this. France and Piedmont will drive Austria out of central Italy, out of northeastern Italy, so that Austria will be out of Lombardy, Modena, Tyrol, Venetia, and Istria. And in return for the French help, the French army will get glory. The Piedmontese will fight, but they'll give as much credit to the French as possible. And as a get-go, France will gain from Piedmont the city of Nice and the mountainous region of Savoy. So, Piedmont, Sardinia ponies up and France takes over Nice and Savoy, which they still have. And um, French armies march through Piedmont, join up with Piedmontese armies and start driving east. Now, the Austrians at first are not expecting any problems. The war really comes as a surprise to them. And the fact that the Franco-Piedmontese army is moving quickly and effectively means that the Austrians start losing battle after battle after battle with fairly little cost to France and Piedmont. So the French uh, and the Piedmontese drive the Austrians out of central Italy, north central Italy, they drive the Austrians out of Lombardy, and they're making hopeful progress in Venetia. But the Austrians understand Napoleon better than the Piedmontese do. And what the Austrians do, sorry, on the screen it looks like my head just disappeared. Uh, what the Austrians do is they send a secret diplomatic mission to Paris. And in this secret diplomatic mission, they say, shh, don't tell anyone. But we'll give you some money, and we'll call it good, and, and we'll say you won. If you just march away right now, the war will be ended. Now, at the same time this is happening, the Austrian army learns to fight. And so the last battle or two before this mission arrives in Paris turn into meat grinder bloodbaths. And Napoleon III is fighting a war to be popular, to make the French feel big and strong like tough guys, not to deprive huge numbers of French mothers of their sons. So the combination of Austria's stiffening resistance and Austria's willingness to do a secret deal with the French that will end the war in a way that will... Um, not discommode the French and that will still give them a, a bit of a public relations victory. Here's what happens. As the Piedmontese and the French are driving east from Lombardy and Venetia, suddenly the French army picks up stakes and leaves. The Piedmontese say, what? <laughs> Sorry. We got orders, au revoir, and they're gone. So now the Piedmontese are alone facing the Austrians, which is not a good position for them. <laughs> so peace is made. France gets its glory. France gets Nice and Savoy. Piedmont gets Lombardy, parts of Venetia, and central Italy. But Austria keeps the Tyrol, Istria, parts of Venetia, it's betrayal. The French betray their word because it suits them. Napoleon III, ladies and gentlemen, what a guy. What was the nickname you gave him again? What? What was the nickname you gave him again? Nappy Baby. But I usually <laughs> use that for his great uncle. <laughs> In any event, it's like calling Mussolini Benny the Moose. Sometimes I just do it. <laughs> okay. Still, the process has begun. And northern Italy is largely now under Piedmont Sardinia. 
Now we come to a new fellow who's living in Brooklyn. Brooklyn. This is Joe Garibaldi, known to history as Giuseppe Garibaldi. Now, Giuseppe Garibaldi is an Italian radical who had to flee to America to avoid getting arrested and thrown in prison by the secret police. Giuseppe Garibaldi has an Italian language newspaper in New York that's extremely nationalistic. And Giuseppe Garibaldi decides he's going to do more than talk. The Count Cavour helped unify Northern Italy. Yeah, the French betrayed, but they're the French. What do you expect? What we're going to do, Garibaldi decides, is we're going to land in Sicily and we're going to march north to Rome. So Garibaldi gathers a bunch of like-minded people from around America and Europe and makes some preparations, and he lands in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. Now, you can't see it because this is a black and white photograph, but this is a bright red shirt. Now, Garibaldi's men were sort of a revolutionary militia. They didn't have money for fancy uniforms, but they could afford red dye. So they all wore these bright red shirts. In fact, Garibaldi's army are called the Red Shirts. Not to be confused with red shirts from the TV show Star Trek, who always died. <laughs> so the red shirts of Garibaldi land in the kingdom of the two Sicilies. And they start marching up north towards Rome. Now, before the army of Garibaldi arrives in a particular region, what the Spaniards would call senoritos, noble young men, Start visiting all of the estates, the latifundias and the latifundistas, the, the wealthy plantation owners in Sicily and southern Italy. And be being young gentlemen, the plantation owners will receive these young, no, young noblemen and listen to what they have to say. And what the young noblemen say is, Garibaldi's coming. And when Garibaldi comes, what we need to do is we need to support him. But isn't Garibaldi a radical? Yes. He talks a good game. But did you know Garibaldi has already promised that whatever territory he gets is going to be joined with Piedmont Sardinia? He has already acknowledged that King Victor Emmanuel, King of Piedmont Sardinia, is his king. He's marching not to make a new radical kingdom in southern Italy, a republic or anything. He's marching just for the same purpose as Cavour in the north is marching. He's marching to make a unified Italian nation. Oh, I still don't like it. It's change. Sir, please listen. In order for things to remain the same, everything must change. In order for things to remain the same, everything must change. Boy, that sounds illogical. <laughs> but let's explain the people are behind Garibaldi. Garibaldi is a charismatic, popular leader. Not just wealthy people, not just the donor class, people in the streets. Men who are willing to fight and die and kill. Now, you can support Garibaldi, who seems radical, but in fact will end up giving all his territory to the monarchy, which is going to be a conservative country. Everything will seem to change, but you'll keep your lands, you'll keep your status, you'll keep your power. If you don't support Garibaldi, sooner or later, probably sooner, someone else is going to come along who, unlike Garibaldi, is not reasonable, is not willing to negotiate, is not willing to accept a nation, even if it means putting off a republic. And at that point, people like you will be up against a wall. That's a euphemism for being shot. In order for things to remain the same, everything must change. So most of the latifundistas, most of the plantation owners, end up supporting Garibaldi as he comes through. And so... <laughs> Cavour marches from the north... Garibaldi from the south, 
Please turn on the light switch. Thank you. And the entire Italian peninsula, except for this area here around Rome, is unified. Cavour marches from the north, taking Tuscany and the Ravenna area and the area east of the Adri uh, Apennines. Garibaldi takes the kingdom of the two Sicilies. They meet up. And now you've got a unified Italy, except for the kneecap. The kneecap is Rome. This is a problem for the Italian nationalists. The Pope is in Rome. Now, the last time the Pope lost his power, was when the French kings captured him at Avignon, or later when the French Emperor Napoleon captures the Pope and brutalizes and brainwashes him to become a mute witness to Napoleon crowning himself Emperor. The French don't have a great record when it comes to dealing with popes. If a kingdom of Italy were to take Rome, wouldn't the Pope become a puppet of the Italian king? Wouldn't the Pope become a puppet and a hostage to Italian politics? Wouldn't the global Roman Catholic Church that the Pope lead, leads be weakened by an Italian government ruling over the Pope? So there is a lot of resistance both inside Italy and outside Italy to the notion of uh, the nationalists finishing the job and taking Rome. Ideas are, are put forward to make Tuscan Florence or Naples or some other city the capital of Italy, maybe Milan. <laughs> the Sicilians wouldn't like that. But the hardcore nationalists, including Cavour, Garibaldi, and people who thought like that, people inspired by Mazzini, they know that the only capital of Italy is Mother Rome. The same Mother Rome that unified Italy back under the Republic. They cannot imagine an Italian kingdom having any capital other than Rome. Now these Italian wars of unification have often come in concert with wars happening in other parts of Central Europe, including a couple of wars of German unification. So now we're going up to the last bit of this. It's 1869, 1870, 1871. And war erupts in, north, in the north between the Germans and the French. And war erupts in Italy between the Kingdom of Italy and the Pope. Italian army columns march into and around Rome. Rome still has city walls at this time. And so modern artillery began to pound the city walls of Rome into rubble. The Italian army marches into Rome and takes most of the city, except for the hilltop where the Pope's palace and St. Peter's Cathedral is. That hill is the Vatican Hill. The Italian armies stop outside of a neighborhood-sized region on the top of Vatican Hill. They don't go in. The Pope is furious, and he calls out to the rest of the world, I am the prisoner of the Vatican. He perceives the Italian troops that have taken Rome and have begun setting up government elsewhere in the city as a force of occupation that has laid siege to his palace neighborhood. He feels besieged. He is a prisoner of the Vatican. What the Italian government makes clear is they have no intention of marching into the Pope's neighborhood. What they're proposing is that the Pope will still run his own country. But instead of it being a, a sizable city-state region, it's going to be a micro-state. It'll be a neighborhood plus Castel Gandolfo, which is an independent palace elsewhere near Rome, plus one or two other territories that the Italian government will grant. The Pope will still be a sovereign. He'll still have a flag. He'll still have an army. 
He'll still have a postal service. He'll still have everything a nation needs. But it's not going to be the city of Rome. It's going to be a neighborhood on Vatican Hill. The Pope is not happy, but the church is going to adapt. So, as Italy has unified with now Rome as its capital, Leaders from around the world come to Rome to a church council called Vatican Council. We now call it Vatican Council I, the first Vatican Council. And this council on the Vatican is to determine how the Catholic Church will remain an independent force, not a hostage to Italian politics, not a puppet of the House of Savoy, which is the royal house that rules Italy now. How is the church going to still assert its independence of all government? And what is determined is, Vatican Council I discovers, theologically, that the Pope has an infallible teaching authority. The word infallible means cannot be wrong. The Lord God Almighty himself has a unique relationship with the Bishop of Rome, the Pope, and that on matters of scriptural teaching and religious doctrine, the Pope is infallible, cannot be wrong, period. Now, this is something that popes had, had asserted with various levels of subtlety for a very long time, but the Church never came out and actually said it. Now they're coming out and actually saying this. Does this mean that when the Pope says, I want string beans, not broccoli. String beans are good. Broccoli is bad. That the Pope is damning all broccoli to hell? No. I mean, you may want him to, but no. That's not a matter of papal infallibility. I'll, I'll give you an analogy. My wife and I are traditional people. And when we got married in July of 1990, after a five-year courtship, we had traditional wedding vows. I vowed to love, honor, and cherish her. She vowed to love, honor, and obey me. This may not work for any of you, but it works for us. Because it means something. Does it mean that I'm always right when we argue? Absolutely not. Does it mean that whenever I say something, she has to do it? No. What it means is this. We don't compete for supreme authority. I'm a husband. I have that traditional authority over her. That's part of our relationship. However, what it's really about is that we're not going to fight about who's in charge. I have seen, and she has seen, too many couples that are so modern that the, the woman or the man insists on being the boss for reasons of vanity or pride or to fulfill the feminist dream or, or to go back to the olden days. In any case, it's, it's prideful and it's, it's destructive. We don't do that. We still have fights. Oh, we have big fights sometimes. But we agreed at the beginning that we wouldn't compete about this. In the end, my decision was going to be final. I was 25 when I got married. So what it really did is it didn't fill me with hubris. It didn't fill me with a sense of power, ultimate, unlimited power. No, it meant I had to be responsible. I couldn't be a boy man. I couldn't be a childlike husband. I had to be responsible because if we had a disagreement and I made the final call and I didn't follow her wisdom, but I followed mine, it was on me. When we first got a kitten, we lived on a horse farm. It seemed safe for me that there were animals outside all the time, that the cat could be an indoor-outdoor cat. And so it was. She, she never liked that, my wife. But she made the obey vow. Had that cat been killed by a car, I would have been blamed. Not because I, God forbid, I drove the car, but because it was my call. When you are in charge, you bear responsibility for the consequences of your decisions. I couldn't be irresponsible with money. I couldn't be irresponsible because I was in charge. 
Now, in all the years we've been married, and we've been together since January of 85, been married since July of 90, I think fewer than time, five times have we actually come to the point of, oh, okay, well, you, you made the obey clause. Now, not being a complete stupid moron, I don't make major decisions without talking to her, if I can possibly help it. And I've learned to respect the fact that despite marrying me, she's pretty darn smart and wise. And sometimes she sees things that I'm blind to. And sometimes I see things that she's blind to. So often my final decision is to go along with her advice because I am persuaded that her advice is probably better. I'm telling you this not to, you know, get you too involved in my own life or to tell you to be patriarchal like me. I'm telling you because that vow is as close as I'll ever get to papal infallibility. The Pope does not assert infallibility in everything he does. What the Pope does is reserves that for special religious teachings. So, for example, the biggest one I can think of was in the early 1970s, Pope Paul VI, not one of my favorite popes, promulgates a papal uh, decree called Humane Vitae, which is hum on human life, which is uh, the church's stance against abortion. And whether you agree with that stance or not, in that case, he was asserting papal infallibility. I think that may have been the only time Pope Paul VI ever did that. So the doctrine of infallibility doesn't mean that the Pope is right about everything. What it means is that on matters of religious teaching, the Pope, according to Vatican Council I, speaks with the authority of God. And that was given to the Pope to compensate for the loss of the Papal States. It was something to improve the august majesty of the Bishop of Rome so that he would not be seen as a lesser figure to the King of Italy or the Prime Minister of Italy or any of that. So there, Risorgimento is the resurgence of Italy and it is achieved by 1871, which is the same year German, German unification is achieved, which we'll talk about next time. Any questions, comments, or thoughts? I see none. Uh, let's see. Today's the 11th. That means Monday the 14th. We have chapter survey 23 due. And also, uh, you should expect a Baker quiz on it. Thank you. You may talk quietly among yourselves. Oh, yes. Who was the first pope, do you know? St. Peter. Christian tradition, not just Roman Catholic, says that Peter, who's the fisherman accomplice of Jesus, an uh, apostle, Peter, who's the first Christian, who's the first human being ever to say, you are the Christ, the Son of God, to so Jesus, goes to Rome and becomes the leader of the Christian community, the Episcopus, or bishop. And so, because Peter was chief of the apostles after the death and resurrection of Jesus, he had special authority within the church. And after the fall of Western Empire, Peter became, the successors of Peter became basically, in effect, overall leaders of the West. Not emperors exactly, but the people that the kings of Western Europe went to for authority and for doctrine. Does that make sense? Thank you. Yeah.